walking is an important part of everyday life. It is used in all activities from leisure to occupation. It is clear to see then that walking is an integral and essential part of everyday life. However, not everyone walks in the same way. Admittedly, there is a spectrum of what can be classified as normal, but there are also many abnormal patterns that need to be recognized. We will be covering an approach to gait assessment, an analysis of normal gait, followed by common abnormal gait patterns including antalgic, short limb, trendelenburg and the stiff hip gait. We will then look at some pseudo gaits that may be encountered. In order to comprehensively assess gait, one needs to employ a systematic approach. Here we chose to use a top to toe approach. Assessment of gait starts when the patient enters the room and ideally should be viewed for 6 to 8 strides from front, back and side. General points to consider are the rhythm, the symmetry, any associated pain and any walking aids. Starting with the head and neck, look for changes with walking. Then moving down to the shoulders, assess whether they are level. Determine whether the arms swing equally on either side of the trunk and if there is any trunkal deviation. Observe the pelvis to gauge if there is any abnormal tilt. Observe the legs for any abnormalities. And lastly, one will need to assess each phase of the normal gait cycle. Normal gait consists of two phases, the stance phase and the swing phase. The stance phase makes up approximately 60% of the normal gait sequence. It starts as soon as a portion of the foot makes contact with the ground and continues as long as a portion of that foot remains in contact with the ground. It begins with heel strike. When the heel makes contact, the foot is dorsiflex at this point. Following heel strike, the full foot makes contact with the ground. This is achieved by relaxation of the dorsiflexes of the foot. Thereafter, mid-stance occurs, during which the body weight is supported by the foot on the ground as the body moves forward. After mid-stance is completed, the heel-off component occurs, during which the heel of the reference foot lifts off the ground whilst the toes are still grounded. Following this, the toes are then lifted off the ground. The foot is plantar flexed at this point. Following toe off, the swing phase of gait begins. During this phase, the reference foot swings forward and is no longer in contact with the ground. This phase makes up approximately 40% of the normal gait sequence. Initial swing is the first component of the swing phase. It begins after toe off and ends when the reference foot is positioned beneath the body. This motion is facilitated by contraction of the flexor muscles of the hip. Mid swing occurs as the foot swings in a forward direction from its position beneath the body. The knee is in a flexed position during this motion. During terminal swing, the knee is extended and the reference foot prepares for the next heel strike. Once the reference foot makes the next heel strike, the gait cycle is completed. Now, how am I supposed to demonstrate an intelligent gait? I'm sure we'll think of something. I don't know. I really don't think I can do it. An antalgic gait is usually associated with a painful limb. The pain can arise anywhere from the spinal cord down to the foot. An antalgic gait is characterized by a shorter stance phase on the affected limb, resulting in a gait that looks like the patient is trying to hop over the affected leg. This is evident in both the anterior and lateral view, where the head can be seen bobbing up and down. So you show us a short limb gait. How am I supposed to demonstrate a short limb gait? Both of my legs at the same time. Don't worry, I got you. The short limb gait is caused by unequal leg lengths. The affected leg is usually the shorter limb, but can also be the longer limb. The gait is characterized by the head moving up and down, whilst the shoulders stay level. To demonstrate this, we have simulated a short limb by using a shoe with a raised heel on one foot and no shoe on the other. Causes of leg length discrepancies can be classified into true and apparent. True discrepancies include congenital causes such as developmental dysplasias of the hip and hemihypertrophy or atrophy. Acquired causes include growth place fractures, improperly healed fractures and infections. It is also important to consider causes of apparent discrepancies such as scoliosis.
The Trendelen gait is an abnormal gait caused by weakness of the abductor muscles, namely gluteus medius and minimus. In a normal patient, the body weight is evenly distributed between both legs when standing. When walking, all the weight is transferred to one leg intermittently and then the next, thus causing a shift in the center of gravity. To compensate for this, the hip abductors on the ipsilateral side contract, thus keeping the pelvis stable. In a patient with damaged, diseased or dysfunctional hip abductors, when the entire body weight is placed on the affected side, the contraction of the muscle is not strong enough to maintain a level pelvis. As a result, the pelvis drops on the contralateral side. This would cause the patient to lose balance and fall due to a shift in the center of gravity. To compensate for this, the patient will lean towards the affected side, thus shifting his body weight over the affected hip and lifting the contralateral pelvis. This can be seen by watching the patient's head and shoulders move from side to side as the patient walks. This can be confirmed using the Trendelenburg test. Causes of a Trendelenburg gait include neuromuscular weakness, pediatric disorders, and iatrogenic causes following hip surgery in which the hip abductors are cut to access the hip. In the stiff hip gait, there is an inability to flex the hip when walking and as a result, the patient elevates the pelvis on the affected side in order to clear the ground and propels the leg forward by rotating the pelvis. Stiff hip gait can be caused by infections of the hip such as TB, ankylosing spondylitis or rheumatoid arthritis. Now we will show you some non-pathological gaits that may be encountered in everyday life. In an ataxic gait, the patient has a loss of sense of balance and coordination and compensates with a staggering wide base gait with the difficulty walking in a straight line. In the absence of this wide compensatory gait, the patient has the tendency to fall. This gait is often seen in cerebellar disease but also resembles the gait of acute alcohol intoxication. I'm sexy and I know it. Oh, 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 o